The story began with the main protagonist, named Yechu, talking about fish, as they were living things familiar to everyone. He also mentioned that if one were to follow the history of biology, then fish had an astonishing reproduction rate, with different varieties of species dating back from the ancient period to the present. It was also noted that perhaps humans only regarded fish as food, and anyone could easily kill them because they had no strength to resist. Yechu then shared that he had personally experienced such a terrifying moment. Let's delve into the exact story of what happened with Yechu. The scene shifts to the city of Wuquan at 5 p.m. in the afternoon, where we find the main protagonist, Yechu, a recent graduate who had come to Wu Yuan City to search for a job and rent a single room. Actually, the problem was that upon entering society, he lacked capital, and his only option was to rent a room in the Wu Yuan district. He also mentioned that the people living there had dubious backgrounds, and many were hesitant to interact with them. So, until he found a real job, he could only endure the suffering of renting a room. One night, the rain fell heavily, causing him to feel tense because he had an interview the next day. He hoped that the rain wouldn't affect the interview. So, despite the rain, he managed to fall asleep. In the morning, while he was sleeping, he felt a strange sensation of water on his leg, which confused him, prompting him to wake up. The moment he opened his eyes, he was stunned to see that his room was filled with water. It was a flood. Yechu wondered whether the flood was caused by the rain from the previous night. Suddenly, he noticed something in the water and was shocked to see fish with human faces wobbling in the water. He wondered how this could be possible. To his even greater surprise, the fish emerged from the water and attacked him. Somehow he dodged the attack, but in the process, he fell into the water himself. As he struggled, other fish inside the water started biting his hand. However, he managed to shake them off. Despite this, the big fish continued to try to attack him, so he quickly got out of the room and closed the door from the outside. Shocked and bewildered, he wondered what was happening to him in this world. However, when he looked outside, he was stunned to see numerous dead bodies floating in the water. It seemed as though the fish had wiped them out. Overwhelmed by shock, he struggled to interpret the situation. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a girl named Qin Xiao shouted at him to watch out, warning him that those human-faced fish would devour them. However, he remained frozen in place. Sayo urged him again to move from that place and come to higher ground for safety. Yechu was so shocked that he couldn't move at all, but when he saw the fish attacking him, he ran to save himself, even though Xiao shouted at him to run or he would be dead. When they reached the stairs where water wasn't flowing, Xiao shared that they were safe for some time, as the fish wouldn't be able to move without water. Confused, Yechu asked her what those things were. However, the girl was surprised to see blood coming out of his hand, indicating he was injured. Yechu reassured her to calm down, explaining it was just a scratch and nothing serious. He then asked again about those weird fish corpses and what was happening there. Xiao responded that she wasn't sure because when she woke up, it was already like that. She also mentioned that not only were there many deaths, but there were also many human-faced fish in the water. She then suggested they go to the rooftop as everyone was seeking refuge up there. The scene then shifted to the rooftop where many people were standing on every house rooftop. Yechu was surprised to see that everyone was there, even the people from dubious backgrounds. As Yechu moved forward towards the railing to look at the surroundings, he was stunned to see that the whole city was flooded. After some time, government officials arrived via helicopter and announced that Wu Yuan City was in a crisis. They urged everyone to be patient and wait for the rescue team. In the meantime, they advised not to touch the water and to properly close the windows at night while waiting for further instructions. They reiterated the warning not to touch the water, and then the helicopter departed from the area. An old man asked a person named Old Zhang whether he thought the fish and the flood were related. Zhang responded that he wasn't sure, but many people had died in the morning, and it was terrible. Suddenly, someone shouted and told them to hurry up as someone needed their help. Upon hearing this, Yechu ran towards the railing and found a boy hanging on a window of the top floor below the rooftop. The boy pleaded for their help to pull him up as he couldn't hold on any longer. Yechu shouted to Xiao to search for some ropes. As the boy began to lose his grip and the fish attacked them, he begged them to save him. By the time Xiao arrived and shared that they had rummaged through Uncle and her room, but there was no rope to be found, Yechu then asked the dubious boys if they had any ropes. One of the dubious boys responded by making fun of the boy hanging there, saying it was such a short distance that he could climb up by himself. Hearing this, Yechu was surprised and shouted at them, expressing disbelief that people were in danger and they were still making fun of it. Suddenly, the hanging boy howled in pain, causing them to rush back to sea. It was a scary moment for everyone as the fish now had hands, holding onto his leg and pulling him into the water. The boy shouted at them to help as the weird monster suddenly grew hands. Old Zhang then took off his shirt and asked Yechu to give his shirt as well. Yechu agreed, realizing they had no other choice. Zhang tied the shirts together and they poured water on it to tighten the joint. They then dropped it in the air for the boy to hold onto so they could pull him up. 
However, when he moved his hand to grab the makeshift rope, his grip loosened a bit. At that moment, the fish gained the upper hand and pulled him with more power. This time, the boy lost his grip with his legs as well, and he fell into the water. At that moment, the boy started howling in pain as the fish began attacking them. Seeing this, the people on the roof became tense. Xiao was terrified by the scene. Old Zhang then shared his belief that there was no safety in a place where there was no water. So, Zhang asked everyone to quickly go back to their respective rooms and close all the windows and doors tightly. Everyone started running towards their rooms. Seeing this, Yechu realized that his room was already occupied by the fish. Fortunately for Yechu, Zhang asked him not to worry, as he knew Yechu lived one floor below him, so Yechu could stay in his room. Zhang also suggested that Xiao move in with them too, as it would be easier for them to take care of each other. Xiao agreed with Zhang's suggestion. Then they went downstairs to old Zhang's room. In a sudden turn of events, three people who didn't know each other, a odd job worker girl, Xiao, a retired veteran, old Zhang, and the main protagonist, Ye Chu, a graduate, needed to rely on one another for the rest of the time until the rescue team arrived. Afterwards, all three came together and arranged the room, investigating the food supplies and materials they had. Despite the challenges, they somehow managed to make it through the first night. In the room, Ye Chu asked Xiao to eat something, knowing they still had to endure the present situation for some days. But Xiao responded that she was fine, as she had just eaten a while ago. Ye Chu then remarked that no one had expected such a catastrophe to occur. He mentioned that he was supposed to go to a few interviews on that day. He also expressed his worry, mentioning that they didn't even know if the rescue teams would be coming or not. She sadly responded affirmatively, mentioning that there was no network on her phone, so she was unable to inform her parents that she was safe. Jang also remarked that it was strange they hadn't seen the rescue team yet, as it was very unusual, and the silence without water was eerie. Suddenly, they heard the weird voices of the fish from outside the door, and panicked, wondering what could be outside at the door. Old Zhang then asked them to keep silent. After that, Zhang tried to put his ear to the door to hear the voices on the other side. Yechu asked whether it could be those mutated fish climbing up the stairs. Zhang responded with a no, as it didn't seem to be, as the voices were coming from upstairs. Zhang then shared that they were on the second floor. On the third floor, there were Old Zhou and those brats. Saying this, he suddenly heard someone shouting to get lost to someone. Hearing which, Zhang got tense and shared that it was Old Zhou's voice. Zhang thought that the yellow-haired brat must have been causing trouble for Zhou. He then shared with Yechu and Xiao that he would go up and check by himself. He even asked them to stay inside as he would go and come back immediately after checking. Yechu even tried to stop Zhang from going, but it was too late. By the time he asked him to stop, Zhang had already closed the door. Xiao then asked Yechu to forget about it as it was the neighbor's dispute, so it's better for them not to interfere. The scene then shifted to one hour later, where both Xiao and Yechu were waiting for Zhang to come back. Yechu showed concern, wondering that it had been a while, but still Master Zhang hadn't come back. Xiao suggested that maybe the matter got resolved, and Old Zhang was talking with Old Zhou. Yechu then stood up and said that he felt there was something wrong, so he would go up and check. He also asked her to stay in as he would come back later. Xiao then asked him if they could go together and see what was happening. Yechu tensely asked her not to go, as there was no need, because what if they encountered those mutated fish who could leave the water? Hearing this, Xiao asked him not to underestimate the girls, as maybe when he was in danger, who knows who was saving who. She then started preparing by taking a stick and taping a ruler and knife to it to make it a weapon for safety. After preparing, she gave the stick to Yechu and asked him to hold it properly, as although it was simple, it shouldn't be a problem when used for self-defense. Seeing this, Yechu also got impressed. Then they both slowly opened the gate and went outside with a torch to see what was happening. But when they came out, there was a deep silence in the staircase. Yechu then said the creepy silence in the staircase passageway made her scared when she remembered that there were mutated fish below. Yechu then again asked her to follow him and carefully watch her step. Slowly, they moved forward towards the floor above, and after going a bit further, Yechu found a Swiss army knife on the stairs. Xiao asked in confusion what he found, to which he responded that seeing the army knife lying around, he got confused as he had no idea whose knife it could be. So he asked Xiao to keep it, as they may have a use for it later. Suddenly, he got stunned and said that he also saw something on the wall. When he focused on that place with the torch, they were shocked to see that it was blood on the wall. Yechu then wondered where it came from and asked Xiao if she had seen it before. Xiao responded that she didn't know, as she was preoccupied with managing some items. She then asked if it could be the injuries of that person during the scuffle on top. As they moved forward, they saw more blood on the ground of the stairs. Seeing this, Yechu said that he thought it was definitely not from an injured person. Xiao then took some blood on the knife and looked at it closely. Yechu then said that he thought the situation was fishy. Master Zhang took a long time and didn't come back, and now there was a blood trail. 
He then tensely asked Xiao to let's hurry and go up, as he felt like something was happening, and those mutated fish definitely ambushed people. So Master Zhang could be in danger, but Xiao held his hand and asked him to calm down and not get anxious, as she was observing the situation, and it could definitely be different from what he was thinking. She then said that she thought the blood was sprayed on the staircase with purpose, as if there was really someone injured, then there should be a trail of blood around the surroundings, and even it was so close to their room, yet they never heard a shout for help. Suddenly, a new type of beast appeared in the scene behind them. Yet you asked again that it was too late, so who would spray blood on the stairway? Shia responded that it could just be that yellow brat venting, as he had done disgusting things before. She also said that she thinks the yellow brat boy dropped the knife there. Yet you responded that he didn't care about that gangster, maybe it's like she said. Yet you then asked her if they should better go upstairs and look for Master Jang. As he was climbing more stairs, he felt something slippery at the boundary of the stairs. When he saw with the torch, it was saliva of someone. But he thought of it as water and wondered where did it come from, as it looked like it was from the top drilling down. Suddenly, Yechu realized that there was something at the top of the stairs. When he put the torch towards it, they were stunned to see that it was a more mutated version of fish, with two legs and four hands. Watching, Yechu tensed up as the mutated fish left the water and came onto land. But still, the fish didn't attack them, which confused everyone. It was strange that the fish showed no aggression towards them at all. To investigate, he used his stick to move the fish away. The moment the stick touched the mutated fish's whisker, it sprang into action and lunged towards them. They were frightened by the sudden attack, but still used the stick to defend themselves. To their surprise, the fish used its hands to walk on land. It even wielded the stick as a weapon, striking back with surprising force. Yechu was almost knocked to the ground by the strength of the attack, but Xiao managed to grab his hand just in time, preventing him from falling. After being saved, he lay on the stairs. But soon the fish got dangerously close, opening its mouth as if to eat him. Before it could strike, Xiao attacked the fish with the stick, sending it flying through the air with the force of the blow. Tensely, Xiao asked Yechu if he was okay or if he had been hurt. Yechu responded affirmatively and jokingly remarked that the one who saved whom was mixed up. Taking the stick from her, Yechu went to attack the fish. But in no time, the fish darted away from its spot and began to run. As the fish dodged his attack, Yechu missed and started shouting at it to wait and not hide. Ignoring the warning, he began to chase after the fish, but Xiao urged him to stop, cautioning that they didn't know if more mutated fish were on the way. Yechu urged Xiao to hurry and suggested they go upstairs to find Master Jiang, sensing something might have happened to him. They dashed towards the third floor, and as they entered, they were shocked to see a larger and more menacing mutated fish waiting for them. This time it was like encountering a horse or elephant-sized fish with long tail, legs, and hands. Behind it, they saw a person. Confused, Xiao asked who was on the floor. Yechu responded that it must be the yellow-haired brat she mentioned earlier. However, it turned out to be Master Zhang who was slowly approaching the mutated fish from behind. With a swift move, Zhang grabbed the fish and began stabbing it with a knife. He then shouted at Yechu to seize the opportunity and evacuate Old Zhou from the room. Tensely, Yechu inquired about Master Zhang's well-being. Zhang, focused on the urgency of the situation, instructed them to go and assist Old Zhou first, as his leg had been bitten off. Agreeing, they rushed into the room to find Old Zhou. Sitting inside, Zhou reassured them not to shout, recognizing them as the neighbors who lived one floor below. Yechu and Xiao were shocked to see Old Zhou's leg, bitten clean in half by the fish. Yechu asked in confusion what had happened to his leg and how the mutated fish had entered the room. Zhou explained that the intelligence of those mutated fish was terrifying. They climbed up using the nearby electric poles. Yechu observed that the mutated fish looked different from the first day they encountered them, noting that the fish didn't have eyes. Zhou agreed, adding that he had also noticed that the mutated fish didn't rely on their sight to navigate their surroundings. He further explained that he and Old Zhang, after narrowly avoiding danger, had been hiding without daring to make a sound. However, their ascent had caused a clatter, which distracted the attention of the mutated fish. Xiao shared that Old Zhang had been gone for a long time, causing them to worry, so they went up to find him. Yechu added that they found the stair passage covered with blood on the walls. Hearing this, Old Zhou shared that it was likely done by the fish. When the sky turned dark, he observed some species engaging in similar behavior and wondered if they were marking their territories in that way. Yechu, feeling tense, exclaimed in shock, Territory making, really? Old Zhou responded that he wasn't sure about the fish's intentions. He suggested they leave the place for now and discuss it later. As they exited, Zhang came flying towards them, prompting them to halt. Zhang shared that despite not knowing where the mutated fish came from, they still seemed intent on attacking and consuming them. The mutated fish roared and lunged towards Zhang once more, but Zhang fought back using a broken table as a makeshift weapon. 
However, the mutated fish proved to be incredibly powerful, and Zhang struggled to hold his own against it. Old Zhou instructed Xiao and Ye Chu to wait while he distracted the mutated fish. He urged them to focus on taking Old Zhang with them, emphasizing that they didn't need to risk their lives to save an old, crippled man like himself. Ye Chu responded to Zhou, urging him not to give up, as they wouldn't abandon him. Furthermore, she pointed out that merely locking the mutated fish away wouldn't provide them with a sense of safety. As Yechu searched his shirt for something to use as a weapon, he found nothing useful at all. He also noticed that the previous knife they had was still lodged in the head of the mutated fish. Though there were bottles around, Yechu thought they weren't useful, as smashing one would render it useless after just one hit against the mutated fish. For assistance, Xiao found something and asked him to take a look. It was the wood used to tie the knife, with sharp edges that could work as a weapon. She suggested that while it might not pierce through the skin, it could be effective attacking through the mouth and piercing through the fish's brain. Yechu liked the idea, so he took the wood stick and asked Xiao to take care of old Zhou. Meanwhile, Zhang continued to battle the mutated fish, but he began to falter in the face of the fish's overwhelming power. As Zhang found himself defenseless, the fish attempted to attack him, but fortunately, Yechu arrived just in time, thrusting the stick into the mouth of the mutated fish. However, the fish held onto the stick tightly. Now, both Zhang and Yechu worked together, pushing with all their might to drive the stick further inside. Even with the combined strength of Yechu and Zhang, they struggled to overcome the mutated fish. Suddenly, the fish began pushing them back, prompting Xiao to join in and assist Ye Chu, while Old Zhou lent his support to Zhang. With their combined effort, they managed to vanquish the monster. Afterward, they breathed a sigh of relief, but the sense of danger lingered. Ye Chu wondered aloud where the mutated fish monster had come from. Zhang speculated that it might be related to the city flood, as they hadn't heard any other news that could explain its appearance. Old Zhang then instructed Ye Chu to tidy up the medical supplies, gather more alcohol, and bandages. He also directed Xiao to bring all the water bottles and consumables from the cabinets in the room. As they both began their respective tasks, Yichu asked Old Zhou about what had happened at the staircase earlier. Zhou explained that he had been feeling bored, so he decided to watch a Chinese opera on his phone. However, those two slime balls couldn't tolerate it, so they decided to pick a fight with him. While they were scuffling, the mutated monster broke through the window and ambushed them. Zhang speculated that the noise might have attracted the monster, as it could be using echolocation to move around. As they collected everything, suddenly one of the brats named Mark arrived, and seeing the dead monster, asked in surprise if they had really managed to defeat it. Mark then searched for his friend, shouting his name. When he saw his friend's lifeless body, he was stunned. Mark shouted, blaming Old Joe for the incident, claiming that his decision to listen to some shitty opera had attracted the monster fish. He also yelled at Zhang, accusing him of purposely not saving Chen due to their past feuds. Hearing this, Zhang stood up and punched Mark in the face, shouting at him to stop. He then asked Mark where he had been when the monster attacked if he was so brave during the scuffle. Mark responded tensely, asking if there was anything wrong with just wanting to stay alive. Old Zhang furiously shouted at Mark, emphasizing that no matter how many grudges they may hold, if Mark wants to live, there must be mutual respect and no troublemaking. He released Mark's collar and instructed him to go to his own room, gather all usable items, and then come back. Yechu then began to reflect on their current situation, stating that it was beyond their expectations as anyone could end up inside the stomach of the mutated fish in an instant. She emphasized that all they could do was cooperate with each other, even if the other party might be someone they didn't like. He shared that afterward, they blocked the staircase below to prevent any more mutated fish from coming up and barricaded from everywhere. After placing the injured old Joe on the bed and completing all the necessary tasks, it was now midnight. Most people fell asleep, trying to put the incident with the mutated fish to the back of their minds. The scene then shifted to the next morning, where everyone was still asleep. Suddenly, Yechu heard the sound of splashing, as if someone was swimming in the water. As he opened the window to take a look, he was stunned to see a horde of fishes swimming in the water below. Just like Yechu, another person from the opposite building was watching them, but suddenly, for reasons unknown, that person opened the window. The moment it opened, all the fish horde moved towards it and climbed up inside the building. After that, the boy was howling in pain. Seeing this, Yechu got frightened and closed the curtain in fear. The sudden change in Yechu's expression made Zhang tense, so he asked Yechu what had happened. Yechu replied, asking him to keep silent. So Zhang ran towards the window to look, and when he looked, he also got scared. Zhang then asked Yechu to find some masking tape to seal the windows. Slowly, they covered the window with tape so that the fish couldn't enter. Zhang then shared with everyone that the mutated fishes had already ambushed the survivors in the opposite building. For their own safety, he asked them not to go near the windows. Zhang asked Xiao about the ration arrangements, inquiring about the food supplies. Xiao responded that, combined with the food supplies from Old Zhou and Mark, they had enough food for 10 days. 
However, the biggest problem was clean water, as they didn't have enough. Based on her estimation, they could only last for one week. Jang then explained that, according to the plan, they had a week's time to wait for the rescue team to arrive. Mark, with a puzzled and angry expression, asked why there was a lack of water when the entire city was flooded. Jang furiously retorted to Mark that if he wanted to feed the fish, then no one was stopping him. Yechu then shared some daunting news about the medical supplies, revealing that there were only three rolls of bandages left, half a bottle of alcohol, and old Joe needed water when he was changing his bandages and washing his wounds. Yechu also mentioned that the most important thing was that they didn't have any antiseptic medicine. Old Joe then assured Jang that he would be fine as he was tough and didn't need to waste so many resources. However, Mark made a sarcastic comment about old Joe, suggesting that Joe made a mess and now wanted them to clean it up for him. Hearing this, Zhang got furious and angrily hit the table. He asked Mark if he had had enough of his rubbish talk, warning him that if he continued to spout nonsense, he dared to believe that he would be thrown out of the room. Furiously, Mark asked if he had said something wrong, pointing out that there wasn't enough food and water for them. He questioned why they needed to consider leaving when they were in a relatively safe condition. Mark also argued that if they moved further, they would have to assist a handicap, questioning if Zhang wanted to send them to their deaths. Before Zhang could respond again, Xiao shouted and asked them to stop fighting. She suggested that instead of arguing, they should focus on finding solutions to resolve the immediate problem. Xiao then proposed that they shouldn't divide the food and water into equal shares, suggesting that the young people like them could endure a bit more. She also advised Master Zhou that he needed to prevent moisture from getting to his wounds to avoid infection. She also told Zhou that if he needed to clean the wound, he should just use the unboiled water from the kettle. Old Zhou responded that he had no problem with that as he wouldn't burden them all. Xiao then shared with everyone that they needed to minimize activities that required a lot of movement to reduce sweating and water loss. Zhang also agreed, emphasizing that everyone would need to endure a little bit as they had to survive until the rescue team arrived. Yechu then summarized that they followed Xiao's advice and distributed the food and water accordingly. However, as each day passed, the food slowly diminished. He also shared that everyone was focusing on the window outside, hoping to hear the sound of help arriving. However, at the window, there were only pitiful cries of the survivors. Until the sixth day, there was no sound, not even a person's shouting or cries coming from the window. The scene then shifted to six days later, where old Joe was in a bad condition, lying on the bed. Yechu asked Zhang about old Joe's condition. Zhang responded that Joe's condition wasn't looking good as his wounds were infected and his fever hadn't subsided. Zhang then asked Xiao how much food and water they had left. She sadly responded that there was still some food left, but the water could only last until the next day. At that moment, Yechu took up his water bottle and noticed that he only had a small amount of water left. He reached to drink it, but for some reason he stopped. Yechu then offered the water to Xiao, suggesting she should drink up since she hadn't had a sip all day. Xiao responded with a no, insisting there was no need for her to drink water, and they would better save it for old Zhou. Suddenly Zhang heard something and asked both of them to stop talking. After listening carefully, Zhang surprisingly shouted, It's the sound of a helicopter! Zhang stood up and went towards the window to confirm. After seeing the helicopters, he felt happy. Zhang then ordered everyone to quickly tie up their shoes and pack up everything as they needed to hurry up to the rooftop. Mark was sitting silently. Seeing this, Zhang shouted at him and asked him to help in packing. Zhang then asked Yechu to come with him as they would help old Zhou together. So they went inside the room to carry old Zhou. At that time outside, Xiao was packing up, but Mark pushed her away and ran towards the outside of the room to reach the rooftop alone. Seeing him running, Xiao tensely asked him not to run and to be careful as there may be mutated fish on the staircase. But Mark didn't hear anything from her and ran away. When Zhang and Yechu came back with old Zhou, Xiao shared that the brat had run away alone. On the other side, the captain of the helicopter team, named Raka, announced for the other helicopters to maintain formation as they were still 25 kilometers away from their designated location. On a helicopter, a trooper named Chang, when he looked down, also got surprised as the location seemed to be in the midst of an apocalypse. Suddenly, he saw someone asking for help from the rooftop of a building. Chang asked the pilot to lower the altitude as there was a survivor on the rooftop. The pilot tensely responded that they hadn't received any orders to rescue survivors. Chang insisted that the helicopters could still carry some more people, so they should take the survivor in first. Reluctantly, they lowered the helicopter and Mark ran towards it. With the help of the army, he managed to get inside. Chang asked if there were any more people in the flat, because if there weren't, they needed to hurry up and leave. Hearing this, Mark got tensed and responded that there was no one left behind, and he was the only survivor, so they should hurry up and leave. So Chang asked the pilot to immediately increase the altitude and follow the troops. By that time, others also arrived on the rooftop, and Yechu shouted for them to stop and not leave as they were still there. Hearing this, when Chang looked down, 
he was surprised to see them. To his even greater surprise, he found Master Jang among them. Chang then furiously asked Mark why he had just said there was no one left. Mark got tensed and responded that he didn't know about them because he didn't know them. Suddenly, they received orders that their mission was their first priority, so the captain asked them to get back in formation. The pilot also asked Chang to think as they needed to carry on with others. Chang was still worried for Master Jang, so he took his bag of supplies towards Jang and the others. Seeing this, the other troops got shocked and asked what Chang had done as those were their army supplies. Chang responded that he threw the supplies bag because it would help Jang and the others to survive for some more days. On the other side, seeing the supplies bag, Yechu shouted that they didn't want anything, they just needed to be rescued, so they should be taken in the helicopter. To Zhang and the others' surprise, all the helicopters moved forward. Inside the helicopter, a troop asked Chang if he knew the people standing on the rooftop. Chang responded with a yes, explaining that the one who carried the injured old survivor was his former instructor. He continued his talk, explaining that while he was in the special forces, he got to know Instructor Zhang, and they lived the army life together for three years. Half a year ago, when he was dispatched to the central area, he saw Instructor Zhang for the last time, as Zhang had already retired by that time. Chang then admitted that he hadn't expected to meet Master Zhang again, and he hoped they could endure until the army completed their mission and returned. Hearing this, Mark laughed and referred to old Zhang as an old fogey person. He even said to Chang that Chang must have suffered a lot, as that old man Zhang was bad-tempered and unreasonable. Hearing this, Chang got furious and put his gun to Mark's mouth. Stunned, Mark asked what it was about. Chang responded that he had discovered a while back that Mark wasn't a good person. In fear, Mark said that he thought he had a misunderstanding with Chang's instructor, old Zhang, so please put the gun down. Chang responded that he didn't care if Mark held grudges with his instructor, but if from the present time Mark dared to hamper their mission, then Mark would have to eat bullets. Mark responded with an, okay. Then, they got another announcement from their leader that they had reached the destination. So upon arrival at the buildings, they immediately needed to carry out the operation. Everyone agreed with it. After some minutes, a helicopter named Alpha-3 shared that they had discovered a large swarm of mutated fish, so they immediately opened fire to eliminate them. Slowly, everyone acknowledged their command and started firing at the mutated fishes to eliminate them. From the sound of bullets, Mark got scared and closed up his ears. After some minutes, when the surrounding got silent, he opened up his ears and eyes. At that time, Chang shared to the other helicopters that it was Alpha-8 speaking, and they were en route, ready for action. Seeing the helicopters landing on a rooftop and troops coming out of it, Mark confusingly asked Chang if they weren't at the safe house. Chang responded with a sorry, admitting that he forgot to tell him that their mission wasn't to save survivors. They had a specific mission, and picking him up was his call. Chang then ran outside the helicopter with others, telling Mark that from that moment onward, he had to take care of himself on his own. The scene then shifted towards Zhang and the others, where Zhang was very angry and shouting in frustration. Zhang was condemning Mark as a coward, wondering how someone could repay kindness with evil and abandon their comrade, questioning how such a person could be considered a man. He even shouted at the government for the blatant lie that rescue was on the way. Seeing Master Zhang so tensed, Xiao shared her belief that the army had to prioritize their mission first, and they were in a hurry, not having the time to take them on board. Yet you also agreed with Xiao, thinking that the rescue support was just behind, and the army had given them supplies. Yet you then asked why they would give them supplies if they didn't want them to endure for a few more days. Zhang apologized to everyone for losing his composure. Xiao then shared that she knew Master Zhang must be tired, so he should rest for a while, and she would organize the stuff. But still, Zhang was very sad, so Yechu asked him not to be down, as he thought what Xiao said was making sense. Jing then responded that he would be frank, as in the present situation, there was no chance of rescue. Hearing this, Yechu shockingly asked why. Jang then shared that he recognized the helicopter number. It was from a base in the city, which meant that the disaster befell not only Wuquan City, but also those cities near the sea. And in a time like this, those to be rescued would be the head honchos, and they were only civilians. Jang then told them that they had to be mentally prepared, if they wanted to live, they could only rely on themselves. Afterward, Zhang asked Xiao if there were any useful items. Sayo responded that there were some medical supplies, canned food, and a few packs of biscuits, but no water bottles. She also mentioned that there were some military supplies and took out a binocular. While Yechu was looking at the binocular, Xiao shouted in surprise and took out a gun, asking them to look at it. Xiao then asked Master Zhang to take a look at the gun. After inspecting it carefully, Zhang shared that it was a Beretta 92 pistol. Zhang thought that there could be more things, so he asked Xiao to give the bag to him as he wanted to see what else could be used. After checking, they found plenty of things inside. Afterward, Zhang shared that they had plenty of things for self-defense now, 
but the problem was that they lacked water, food, and medical supplies. Xiao also mentioned that they only had two bottles of water. Hearing this, Zhang became tense and wondered aloud that they couldn't even risk drinking water from outside. Apart from the danger of mutated fish, they didn't know if the water was safe for consumption in the first place. Zhang then informed everyone that they needed to consider finding water through other means. He took the binoculars and looked outside from the window. Yechu then asked Zhang if he had discovered anything. Zhang then handed the binoculars to Yechu and asked him to take a look at the other side of the street. When Yechu looked through the binoculars, he saw a grocery store and a pharmacy at the intersection. He then asked Zhang if he was referring to those places. Zhang responded with a yes, explaining that since the main door was closed and locked, it indicated that the supplies inside hadn't been taken after the catastrophe. Hearing Zhang's explanation, Yechu tensely asked if Zhang was considering getting medicine and water from the shops across the street. Zhang responded with a yes, explaining it was the best approach he could think of. Afterward, Zhang took out a piece of paper and started drawing a map of their surroundings. He asked Xiao and Yechu to look at the map, pointing out that the pharmacy and the food store on the street were the only way for them to get clean water and medical supplies. He also shared that there was one block between them and the shops. Yechu expressed his concern, saying that he thought getting there wouldn't be so simple. Zhang responded with a yes, acknowledging the challenge, but he assured them that they had two methods to accomplish the task. Zhang then explained the first method, which involved crossing the blocks using planks, one step at a time. They would then access the store by going down from the second floor after reaching the rooftop. Xiao responded, pointing out the problem with the first method, as they didn't know the distance between the blocks, and they were uncertain about accessing the rooftop. Zhang acknowledged Xiao's concerns and explained that there was also a second option available. Zhang shared that the second option was to use the covered cable wires on the second floor to climb there and enter through the window. However, he cautioned that it was close to the water and very dangerous. For the present moment, he couldn't think of any other ideas to reach the shops, as these were the only methods that could work. Xiao then carefully examined the map and pondered for a moment. With a hint of excitement, she shared that she believed if they attempted it at night, the second method might be possible. Hearing this, both Zhang and Yechu were surprised and asked, What? Xiao responded, pointing out that she wasn't sure if either of them had noticed. But for the past few days, mutated fish had been making a lot of noise during the daytime but were quiet at night. It seemed that mutated fish were sleeping at night. So, as long as they didn't touch the surface of the water, they wouldn't pose a threat to people who were out of reach. Yechu tensely shared the problem that they had encountered other kinds of mutated fish at night. Sayao responded that she had also noticed that, and based on their earlier encounters, the mutated fish at night didn't seem to have vision. So, if they could avoid the mutated fish, they wouldn't be a problem at all. Zhang agreed with Xiao, acknowledging that her theory could indeed be plausible. He then told both of them that he would climb up the wires while they both stayed in the room to guard. However, Yechu shouted a firm, no, which confused both Xiao and Zhang as they looked at Yechu in bewilderment. Yechu asked Master Zhang to let him take the lead this time, as Zhang had always been taking care of them. Yechu wanted the opportunity to take responsibility and do his part of the work. Zhang tried to deny it, but Yechu interrupted him, adding that climbing those cables would require someone lightweight. Hearing this, Zhao also agreed with Yechu, recognizing that weight was indeed a crucial factor they had overlooked. Zhang then thought for a moment and finally agreed to proceed the way they both were asking. The scene then shifted to nighttime, where Yechu was getting ready with his gear. After getting prepared, he informed everyone that it was time to go. He had a tied rope with him, and Zhang shared with Yechu that if he ran into trouble, he should quickly pull the rope, and Zhang would immediately come to his aid. Xiao also handed him something, mentioning that she had made a weapon for self-defense. She explained that she used metal thread to tie a metal pipe and a knife together, ensuring it was sturdier than the previous one. Yechu then took the weapon and put it inside his bag. Zhang also agreed with Xiao and instructed Yechu to use it. He reminded Yechu to remember how he taught him to use it, emphasizing not to waste ammunition when facing danger. Yechu responded with an okay and asked them to also be careful. He assured them that he would return immediately once he obtained water and medicine. So after that, Zhang slowly lowered Yechu towards the cable. For the twist, someone else was in the city, observing Yechu through binoculars. After seeing Yechu, a girl shared with her partner that she hadn't expected anyone else to survive. However, she remarked that those survivors were scarier than the mutated fish. After landing safely on the cables, Yechu breathed a sigh of relief. Zhang also inquired whether the cables were sturdy. Yechu reassured him that the cables were okay as they could bear his weight, so Zhang could release the rope now. After landing, he stood up and surveyed the route, realizing he needed to cross over the water's surface. He decided to proceed slowly, taking it one step at a time. Yechu moved forward slowly, but steadily. At one point, a wire lock broke, causing him to nearly fall into the water due to the loosening grip. 
However, he managed to hold himself on the wire just in time. The broken piece fell into the water, startling Zhang and Xiao as they watched Ye Chu's precarious situation. Even Ye Chu sighed in relief after escaping danger. However, his relief was short-lived when he heard the sound of rushing water, causing fear to grip him as he wondered if it was the mutated fish. His suspicions proved correct as the mutated fish emerged from the water, leaping towards him in an attack. Witnessing the scene, everyone tensed up, unsure of what action to take. To their surprise, the mutated fish couldn't reach the height of the cable and retreated back into the water. With a sigh of relief at narrowly escaping a major threat, Yechu resumed moving forward. As he moved further, he stumbled upon something that left him stunned. Meanwhile, Zhang confided in Xiao that he couldn't see Yechu's progress anymore, speculating that Yechu should be reaching the third block. However, Zhao urged Zhang to take another look, pointing out that Yechu was waving the flashlight at them. Upon seeing this, Zhang wondered if Yechu could be in trouble once again. Peering through the binoculars, he observed that the wire had been cut to a specific length, preventing Yechu from reaching the third block. Upon closer inspection, Zhang realized that this could only have been done by people, leading him to wonder in surprise if there were more survivors nearby. Zhang confided in Xiao that the situation had become very complicated, prompting them to signal Yechu to return. Sai signaled Yechu to come back, and Yechu agreed, mentioning that he would attempt to return via the rooftop. As Yechu made his way back slowly, he glanced inside a window and was shocked by what he saw inside. Yechu's shock turned into curiosity as he saw a jar of water with a tap inside the building. Xiao urged Zhang to pay attention to Yechu's signals. Through the binoculars, Zhang observed that Yechu was indicating his desire to enter the middle building. Zhang speculated whether Yechu had found something useful as he entered the room. Meanwhile, Yechu made his way into the room through the window, discovering it to be empty. Undeterred, he approached the jar of water and filled up his water bottle using the tap. As Yechu filled his water bottle, a sound from inside the cupboard caught his attention. Curious, he opened the cupboard to investigate. However, his curiosity turned to fear and shock as he discovered a cage containing a captured mutated fish inside. Startled by the sudden discovery of the mutated fish in the cage, Yechu instinctively took a step back. To his further astonishment, he felt something unusual under his foot. Looking down, he was stunned to find the lifeless body of a woman. Out of nowhere, a bald man named Henry appeared and reassured Yechu not to worry, explaining that the woman had broken his rules and had been dead for several days. He admitted to disposing of her, but disturbingly mentioned that using the meat from the dead woman to bait the mutated fish gave him pleasure. Hearing this, Yechu was both surprised and shocked, asking Henry if he truly disposed of the woman. Henry confirmed, explaining that she had climbed the cables from the adjacent room and demanded water for free, refusing to trade with other items. She pleaded incessantly, claiming her daughter was in dire need of water. Yechu was deeply shocked to learn that the woman simply needed water for her daughter, and Henry's actions startled him. Henry responded, admitting that he felt sorry for the woman's daughter, but deemed the situation unfortunate nonetheless. Henry's words sent a chill down Yechu's spine as he compared those who took things without paying to the mutated fish. Suddenly, Henry grabbed Yechu's neck tightly, accusing him of wanting to steal water like the woman. He declared that Yechu had to die, as he would dispose Yechu by himself. Yechu swiftly dodged Henry's attack by grabbing his hand, urging him to calm down and emphasizing the need for cooperation to survive in such a situation. However, Henry's response was unsettling. He laughed and demanded that Yechu hand over everything he had, promising him a painless death in return. Yechu fought back fiercely, using a rod as a weapon against Henry. Henry was taken aback to see Yechu armed. Despite their struggle, Henry remarked on Yechu's agility and speed, suggesting that he had eaten in the past few days. Henry's demeanor shifted to one of satisfaction, considering wiping Yechu as a profitable outcome. In his haste, Yechu launched an attack at Henry, but Henry dodged with a smile, confident in his ability to defeat Yechu. However, fate intervened as the mutated fish grabbed hold of Henry's hand this time, pulling him towards itself and biting his hand viciously. Henry's cries of pain echoed in the room as he pleaded for Yechu's help. Yechu quickly retrieved the gun and aimed it at the mutated fish. Henry, shocked by the sight of the gun, urged Yechu to shoot the fish without hesitation. Henry's shouts grew more frantic as he implored Yechu to fire the gun and not leave him to die. Despite the urgency of the situation, Yechu hesitated, trembling with fear. Henry's voice rang out again, demanding to know what Yechu was waiting for, questioning if he wanted Henry to be bitten to death by the mutated fish. Henry's insults cut deep as he branded Yechu a bastard, accusing him of abandoning people to die and regretting not disposing of him earlier. Overwhelmed by Henry's words and the intensity of the situation, Yechu's consciousness slipped away. In a daze, he fired the gun without aiming, succumbing to the chaos of the moment. Upon hearing the gunshot, Zhang and Xiao were filled with fear. Zhang, tense with worry, instructed Xiao to take care of herself and Zhou as he rushed to find Yechu. 
Using a rope, Jang descended quickly on the cables. Meanwhile, near Yechu, it was evident that Henry had been disposed of. Yechu was shocked and wondered how it had turned out like that, as he had only wanted to save Henry. Suddenly, he heard a voice coming from the window. Without thinking, he pointed the gun towards it. But this time, it was Jang, so he asked Yechu to calm down. Zhang then asked Yechu what had happened just moments ago, why he had shot and at whom. While asking, Zhang noticed the surroundings and tensely asked what had happened with them. Yechu sadly responded that he had wanted to get some water when he was attacked by Henry, and Henry had even attacked the woman lying on the floor. Yechu also explained that during the scuffle, Henry got bitten by the mutated fish in the cage, so he had wanted to use the gun to shoot the fish and save Henry. But somehow, he ended up shooting Henry instead of the fish. Zhang responded to Yechu, telling him not to be tense as it wasn't his fault. It was Henry's perverted nature that had grown during the crisis that was the cause. Zhang then urged Yechu not to blame himself, as it wasn't the time for it. They needed to check the room for anything they could use, so they slowly went further into the adjacent room to find some supplies. Meanwhile, the mutated fish, seeing them moving away from the room, seized the opportunity and slowly took the cage keys from Henry's pocket. In the room, Yechu found some rations in the cupboard and snacks in a carton. He told Zhang that he had found rations and grocery items. Zhang also mentioned that he had found many water bottles stored in the cupboard. Yechu also noticed there were many jugs of water and interpreted that they must have been looted from others and the grocery store during the crisis. Zhang then shared his suspicion that Henry had attacked more than one person. He also asked Yechu not to worry too much about it and focus on gathering as much as possible. Meanwhile, Xiao was anxiously waiting at the window for both Yechu and Zhang. Suddenly, to her surprise, someone from above entered her room directly through a rope. Startled, she attempted to shout for help, but before she could, the girl covered Xiu's mouth and reassured her not to be afraid, explaining that they just wanted to take cover for the time being. Xiao, surprised, asked who they were and if they were survivors like her. The girl responded affirmatively, explaining they were indeed survivors of the catastrophe. Suddenly, Xiao heard another voice declaring that they were finally safe, at least for the time being. When Xiao looked, she saw it was a boy. The boy also mentioned that the mutated fish hadn't chased them. Meanwhile, the scene returned to Jang and Yechu, who were both carrying as many things as they could in their bags. Jang then offered Yechu a water bottle to drink. As Yechu drank, he looked very sad. Observing this, Zhang asked what was troubling him, wondering if he was still thinking about the recent incident. Yechu responded with a yes, expressing that even though that person deserved to die, he had missed his shot and ended up shooting them, weighing heavily on his heart. Zhang then shared with Yechu that he reminded him of a soldier he once trained. Zhang then began sharing about a person named Chang. Chang was a new soldier in the special forces, struggling during training and until his first mission, when he eliminated an enemy for the first time. From that point onwards, he completely transformed into another person. Zhang also shared that he always found Chang drinking beer. He believed that when someone made their first kill, there would be an internal struggle in their heart, as the person they had killed might have been an enemy or even a truly evil individual. It was a matter of respecting life, but part of that respect might gradually diminish under the pressure of the catastrophe, which had him worried. Zhang then asked Yechu to stop talking as they needed to hurry back. As they were about to leave, they suddenly heard something from behind. When Yechu looked back, he was surprised and acted strangely, running towards the cabinet to check. Seeing this, Zhang asked what was happening. Yechu responded that he thought the cabinet had been moved by something. When Yechu looked behind the cupboard, he shockingly told Zhang that there was something behind it. Curiously, they managed to move the cabinet somehow, and the moment they saw behind it, they were shocked to find a big hole in the wall. When they looked inside, they saw that cables had been used to make a bridge between the two rooms. Seeing this, Zhang said that he thought it must have been done by Henry. After Henry cut the cables outside, he must have used them to steal stuff from the next room. Yechu also responded that it was the reason there was no need to wonder why Henry's room had so many groceries. Zhang was also shocked that the fighting outside in the city was beyond their expectations. Suddenly, Yechu remembered something and asked Zhang if the pharmacy shouldn't be near the room. When Yechu switched on the torch to look into the other room from the window, he was surprised to see a little girl in the window. So Yechu wondered whether the girl was the child of the woman. Zhang agreed with Yechu, considering it possible that the girl was the daughter of the deceased woman. Zhang then shared with Yechu that they had to save her, as they couldn't leave the little girl alone in the room. So they slowly moved on the cables to reach the other side of the room. When they entered, they saw many medicines, including antiseptics and bandages, just what they needed. Suddenly, something dropped to the floor, catching Yechu's attention. But Zhang asked Yechu to ignore it, emphasizing that first, they needed to find the little girl. So they slowly moved into another room adjacent to that one. They saw that the room had some medical devices, and suddenly Yechu heard a voice coming from the cupboard. So Zhang ordered Yechu to open the door from that side while he stood on the opposite side. 
The moment Yechu opened the door, the little girl came out with a knife and started slicing it through the air with her eyes closed, trying to protect herself from them. She was shouting at them not to come close, accusing them of being bad people. Without stopping, she continued slicing the knife, demanding that they stay away and leave. Zhang and Yechu raised their hands in surrender, trying to show they meant no harm. So the girl stopped for a moment. Zhang then asked her to put the knife down, explaining that they were not bad people, despite what she might think, and that they only wanted some water and medicine and wouldn't hurt anyone. The girl child started crying, so Yechu reassured her not to cry, reminding her that they had dealt with the bad person. The girl child's name was Lily. Lily then stumbled to the ground and started crying, asking why they didn't give her mother back. She kept pleading with them to somehow give her mother back. Hearing the voice, a mutated fish was moving slowly towards it. Even the mutated fish passed by the front of Xiao's room. So the boy in the room shared that there was still one fish below them. The girl saw Xiao looking so sad and tired, so she offered her some water, thinking Xiao must be thirsty. The boy shouted at the girl, asking her what she was doing, as they didn't even have enough water for themselves to drink. The girl shouted at the boy, arguing that those people had brought them inside out of goodwill, so giving one bottle of water as compensation wouldn't be too much. Xiao spoke up, noting that looking at them, they had such good weapons and equipment, so they probably weren't from Wu Quan. The girl then apologized for not introducing herself earlier. She introduced herself as Liu, a competitive archer. Liu also explained that when the catastrophe happened, she was practicing in the archery range. She then introduced the boy as Li. He was a bodyguard working in the archery range, and they escaped together after the whole mess started. Li then took out a shotgun and shared that luckily, he had taken it while escaping, and it was a very useful tool for dealing with the mutated fish and humans. Hearing this, she asked in shock, Deal with humans? What do you mean? What's the situation outside? Liu responded that it was chaotic, and humanity's fight for survival had just begun, and in the future, it could get much worse. Xiao tensely asked if everyone had started attacking each other. Li then asked what they needed to worry about, stating that if someone wanted to rob them, they would just finish them off immediately, like how they dealt with those silly goons. Hearing this, Xiao asked in surprise if they had already killed two people. Lao shouted at Li, asking if he was out of his mind for mentioning that in front of a stranger. Li argued that there was nothing wrong in saying that, as those two hooligans had always taken advantage of him, and letting them die was their just desserts. Lao saw that Xiao was getting tense and uneasy, so she asked her not to worry, reassuring her that it was for self-defense, and they didn't attack innocent people. Li also agreed, saying what Sister Lu said was correct, but in situations like that, they didn't need to reason with unreasonable people. The only thing they could do was to use everything available to protect themselves. Hearing this, Xiao was scared and asked, Even for self-defense, why do they need to harm people? Liu asked Xiao not to misunderstand them, as they had no choice. Seeing this, Li asked Liu to save her breath, as she didn't need to explain to Xiao, because Xiao would later experience it herself in the future. He also told Xiao not to pay too much attention to them, as once the outside monster left, they would also depart and head to their destination. He hoped that they would all meet again without becoming enemies. Suddenly, Li was surprised and asked what they should do about the monster going into the pharmacy block. Hearing this, Xiao got shocked and tensely shouted the names of Yechu and Old Zhang. Liu was surprised to hear Xiao and asked her if her two comrades were inside the pharmacy block. Xiao responded with a yes and asked how Liu knew about it. Liu then stood up and took her bow in hand. Seeing this, Xiao tensely asked Liu what was happening. Liu then asked Li if he thought they went to the pharmacy because Xiao and her friends needed it. Li responded with a yes, as there was a high possibility since one of Xiao's comrades was injured, but they would need it if they sought refuge in the supermarket. Liu expressed that she didn't want any more clashes to happen. Xiao was tense and didn't know what to do. The scene then shifted to the other side in the pharmacy block, where the mutated fish that couldn't see entered. Another mutated fish, capable of swimming and seeing, was also moving around. Even the larger mutated fish ate the mutated fish that could see. Meanwhile, in another room, Lily was eating very hastily, looking like she hadn't eaten anything until now. So Zhang asked her to eat slowly and even offered her a water bottle. So Lily took the water bottle and started drinking it hastily. Seeing this, Zhang shared that he thought the kid must have been starving horribly. He then told Yechu that while the girl was emotionally stable, to take the opportunity to sort out all the medical stuff. So Yechu moved around and saw that there were many empty bottles on the table. He decided to look for some alcohol and bandages. Suddenly, he saw a cabinet and opened it, but it still contained all the used items. Fortunately for Yechu, he found a first aid box in the lower bracket of the cabinet. When he opened it, he was happy to see so many usable items. He also found a diary inside the bag. Meanwhile, on the other side, Zhang was asking Lily what had happened in the last few days and where everyone was. But Lily wasn't responding. 
So Zhang told her that he knew she was feeling down, but asked her to trust them, as they weren't bad people. They just needed some emergency medicine and water, which was why they had come. Suddenly, Yechu asked Master Zhang to look at the cabinet. Zhang stood up and asked Yechu what he had found. Yechu asked Zhang to look at the diary. When Zhang looked inside, he found instructions on how to use the first aid kit. Yechu said that it was right, as they needed the whole bag. Zhang also got happy, knowing that old Zhou needed the medicine. Suddenly, to their surprise, Lily snatched the diary from old Zhang's hand. Lily then started shouting that they were all liars, as they had just said they only needed water and medicine. She then said that her mother had given her the family's life savings items, and they also wanted to take them. Zhang then asked Lily to listen to them, as they had a comrade who was seriously injured, and his condition was dire, and the bag could save his life. But Lily got so frustrated with them and shouted that it was all a lie, so she wouldn't give them the bag. Zhang then apologized, explaining that they really needed the bag and slowly started moving towards her to snatch the bag. Seeing this, Yechu asked Zhang what he was doing. But before Zhang could respond, suddenly he got attacked by the mutated fish from behind. As Zhang's face got surrounded by the fish's tongue, and the fish pulled him back towards itself. At that moment, Lily and Yechu were stunned and frightened, not knowing what to do in that situation. The mutated fish kept pulling Zhang relentlessly, and he was dragged along the floor. Eventually, the fish's grip loosened, giving Zhang the opportunity to draw his gun. Zhang then kept shooting at the mutated fish's tongue to free himself from its grasp. Surprisingly, he succeeded in destroying the fish's tongue. However, as he attempted to remove the remaining part of the fish's tongue, the creature tried to attack Zhang again. This time, Yechu intervened and attacked the fish with an oxygen cylinder. Yechu kept hitting the fish, but it retaliated by striking her with its tail, sending both Yechu and Zhang flying towards the wall. As the fish approached them again, Yechu pulled out her gun and started shooting. The mutated fish backed away to take cover. Yechu then asked Zhang if he was alright, to which Zhang responded with a yes, indicating that he was fine. Zhang was about to reach for his gun, but before he could, Lily appeared out of nowhere and grabbed the gun from the ground. Zhang was surprised to see her and quickly warned her not to be reckless, as the gun was loaded. Tensely, Zhang told Lily that they could negotiate, but he asked her to return the gun first. Lily responded defiantly, stating that since they had guns, they must be bad people. Yechu shouted at Lily, reminding her that they were in a dangerous situation and not to escalate it further. Suddenly, Yechu noticed the fish approaching again and warned Zhang to be careful. The fish attacked, but luckily it struck a shelf beside them instead. Zhang and Yechu quickly used the shelf as cover to protect themselves and the girl from the fish. As the fish slowly approached, Lily became tense, and both Zhang and Yechu were unable to free their hands due to holding the shelf. It seemed like a dire situation for Yechu and Zhang. However, to their surprise, Lily started shooting at the fish without even looking towards it. Yechu and Zhang also closed their eyes in fear of being hit by the bullets. When the sound of gunfire ceased, they cautiously opened their eyes and saw that the mutated fish was dead. They moved away from the shelf, but Lily was still aiming the gun at the mutated fish. Zhang approached her and asked her to calm down, reassuring her that the fish was already dead. He also attempted to take the gun back, explaining to Lily that it was unsafe for her to carry it. However, Lily quickly moved her hand back, trying to cover the gun so that Zhang couldn't take it. Zhang then told Lily that they wouldn't take her stuff anymore, so she should please give them their gun back. Lily shouted that they could take the first aid kit, but first, they had to promise her something. On the other side, it became evident that numerous mutated fish were converging towards the pharmacy block. Li observed this and informed Lu and Xiao that the disturbance seemed to have attracted all the nearby mutated fish. Hearing this, Xiao became tense and started worrying about Yechu and Zhang. Li then suggested that they could use the length of the rope to cross the rooftops. However, before proceeding, he asked Xiao to set terms since he was going into the pharmacy block to get what he needed. Saya requested that they help her comrades, so if the pharmacy had enough items, everyone could take whatever they wanted. But if there wasn't enough to go around, the items Yechu and Zhang took would belong to them as long as both of them could escape safely. Xiao agreed with this condition, as she was okay with everything as long as both Yechu and Zhang returned safely. Liu then offered the bow to Li, suggesting that he take it with him as it could help him in a pinch. However, Li declined, stating that he had no use for it. Furthermore, he mentioned the need to stabilize the situation at Xiao's place, emphasizing that their intentions had been exposed and Xiao might not see them as good people anymore. Liu agreed and reassured Li not to worry about them, emphasizing the importance of returning immediately after finishing his task. Li responded with an okay, and then proceeded towards the rooftop to make his way to the pharmacy block. On the other side, all the mutated fish began climbing inside the pharmacy block, presenting a terrifying sight. Meanwhile, the scene shifts back to Lily and the others, where Lily had already made her promise, and Zhang and Yechu had agreed to it. Lily asks them to keep their promise. Zhang reassures her not to worry, 
as they will definitely keep their word. Lily, feeling tense and desperate, asks when they can leave. Zhang explained that they couldn't leave immediately as they needed to treat their friend's injuries first. Once his condition stabilized, he promised they would uphold their end of the deal. Ye Chu then asked Lily about the whereabouts of the people from the pharmacy block and whether there were any survivors. Zhang also inquired about what had happened in the pharmacy block. Lily responded that she didn't really know what had happened outside the block, but once the mutated fish appeared, she and her mom stayed in their room. She also explained that her mother ran the pharmacy, so they lived there, and they were trapped inside when the flood came, unable to leave. She mentioned that the opposite building housed the food store, and everyone, including her mother and herself, went there to purchase food. She also shared that during the night, the mutated fish climbed the stairs and attacked humans at first sight. Her mother managed to block the pharmacy door on the second floor, but the cries from outside continued until the next morning. Zhang then informed her that it was the same on their side, as his friends were ambushed by the mutated fish on the first night and suffered injuries. Ye Chu then asked if Lily knew Henry, the bald guy on the next floor. Lily responded that Henry arrived by the cables on the third day, and they assumed he was trying to escape from the mutated fish. However, they later discovered that Henry was actually a thief who attacked people. She also revealed that Henry had hurt her mother and stolen all their food and water. Lily continued to share that her mother was worried that Henry would return, so she cut the cables outside the window to prevent him from finding a way back in and stealing the remaining food and water. Lily recounted that after her mother cut the cables, she became worried about starving, so she went to beg Henry for some food and water. However, she never returned. Lily then started crying. Hearing Lily's story, Zhang shared that during a catastrophe, morality often vanished, and the worst of humanity was revealed. He asked Lily to stop crying, reassuring her that Henry had already met his end, and perhaps it was deserved. Lily, still crying, asked why her mother didn't come back. Zhang, unsure of what to say, took a few moments to think before responding. He suggested that perhaps her mother had been rescued by a helicopter during the day, but was unable to take them due to time constraints. Seeing everything unfold, Yechu couldn't help but wonder about the grim reality of their situation. In such dire circumstances, they were forced to resort to lying to children to keep them calm and to arm themselves to fight for survival. Yechu pondered how long they could endure the challenges ahead, relying on their will to live and their ability to cooperate with others. Suddenly the sound of breaking glass shattered the tense atmosphere, startling Lily. As Yechu and Zhang turned towards the source of the noise, they were shocked to see numerous mutated fish converging towards them. Zhang realized that the sound they had made earlier had attracted all the mutated fish. Slowly, every mutated fish began advancing towards them, intent on attacking. However, they managed to defend themselves by shooting at the approaching fish with their gun. Lily shouted and urged Zhang and Yechu to use alcohol. Confused, Yechu asked what she meant. Lily explained that the skins of the mutated fish were sensitive to alcohol. She had seen someone use alcohol to drive them away before. Yechu urgently asked Zhang to hurry and find the alcohol. However, Zhang had already begun taking them out, assuring Yechu not to shout as there were plenty of bottles. They started throwing alcohol towards the mutated fish one by one, but with so many of them, it wasn't having much effect. Realizing that there were too many mutated fish and not enough alcohol to deter them, Zhang instructed Yechu to stop wasting bullets and suggested they run. Zhang and Lily began removing the barricades they had placed across the door to lock it. However, when Zhang opened the door, he saw something that shocked him. Actually, Jang was shocked to see Yechu being chased by mutated fish, but somehow Yechu managed to dodge them and emerged from the room. He quickly blocked the door with everything he could find. Jang shouted to Yechu, urging him to make his way to the stairs, for this was their chance to escape to the roof and come up with a plan. The mutated fish were constantly trying to break out of the room. Lily and the others started running towards the rooftop. To their surprise, a mutated fish emerged from above and attacked Lily. In an instinctive move to protect her, Jang got in between them, risking himself. During the struggle, Zhang's hand was bitten off by the mutated fish, but he managed to defeat it nonetheless, ensuring Lily's safety. Blood flowed from Zhang's hand, causing Lily to become terrified. However, Zhang reassured her that he was alright, and urged her to go upstairs and open the door to the rooftop. He also called for Ye Chu to hurry. As Ye Chu rushed towards the rooftop, he suddenly felt someone pulling him back. Turning around, he realized that someone was being engulfed by the body of a mutated fish. Startled, Yechu realized it was actually that person who had grabbed onto him from behind, trying to hold him back. When Yechu looked back, he saw that the person was Mark, pleading for Yechu to save him. However, Yechu realized that the mutated fish were closing in on them, and even Zhang urged him to ignore Mark as they were in imminent danger. With no other choice, Yechu left the bag with Mark and hurriedly ran away to safety. Meanwhile, Lily reached the topmost floor and attempted to open the door, 
but she struggled to do so. To her surprise, the door swung open from the other side, causing Lily to stumble and fall to the floor. As she looked up, she saw a man holding a shotgun in his hand. Meanwhile, on the other side, Yechu was fiercely shooting down the mutated fish that were chasing them. There, the man asked Zhang about his injury. But to their surprise, not only were mutated fish coming from below, but some also appeared from the stairs above. Seeing this, Yechu tensely shouted at Zhang to watch out as a fish was about to attack him. The moment Zhang looked up, he saw the fish already leaping towards him for the attack, so he instinctively covered his face for safety. However, to their surprise, they heard the sound of a gun, different from the pistol. When Zhang opened his eyes, he saw that the mutated fish had been killed. As they turned towards the source of the sound, they were surprised to see Lily with a man holding a shotgun. Both Zhang and Yechu wondered about the identity of the man. Li was also worried and shared that they were in a problematic situation, as the entire building had been overrun by mutated fish. Now, they faced the challenge of figuring out how to proceed. With strangers in their midst and uncertainty about the number of mutated fish in the building, they need to devise a plan to tackle the situation. 